What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, here to a reading of the Bitcoin Optech Group newsletter. Thank you very much to all the sponsors and associates of this amazing open source organization. Today, number 31, January 29th, 2019. This week's newsletter summarizes a post about the privacy-improving PayJoin proposal. It links to top voted questions and answers from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. And it describes another busy week worth of notable commits in popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Action items. None this week. Well, it's vacation time. News. Posts about the BIP79, that's pay it to endpoint or pay join. Join market developer Adam Gibson, or Wixwing, sends a post to the Bitcoin Dev mailing list about the simplified version of the pay-to-endpoint proposal described in BIP79. The proposal allows an on-chain spender to include an input from the person receiving the transaction alongside the spender's own input preventing blockchain analysis from being able to reasonably assume that all inputs come from the same person. This could make blockchain analysis significantly less reliable, even if only a fairly small number of people actually use this feature. Newsletter number 27 is for details. Gibson's suggestion focused on modifying the proposal based on his experience implementing a pay-to-endpoint-like protocol in the development version of JoinMarket, as well as feedback he's received from the developers of Samurai Wallet, who have also implemented a variant of the protocol still in developer for uh, testing. This goal is to try to get both wallets and many others to use the same protocol and also have it supported by payment processors such as BTC Pay. The suggestions are plenty simple. Version the protocol so spending clients and receiving servers can negotiate what protocol features they support. Rename the protocol to PayJoin, as many people aren't quite sure what to call it right now. Use BIP-174 partially signed Bitcoin transaction for communicating transactions and signature data between clients and servers. Specify the transactions should use a short list of best practice transaction features and avoid odd-looking coin selection so that pay join transaction blend with the normal transactions and create maximum confusion for blockchain analysis. Selected questions and answers from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. The Bitcoin Stack Exchange is one of the first places where Optech contributors look for answers to their own questions or when we have a few spare moments of time to help curious or confused users. In this monthly feature, we highlight some of the top voted questions and answers made since our last update. This selection was omitted last month to make room for our year-end special. So this update includes entities or entries from both December and January. So it's a big one. First, we have a question asked by Merch. What criteria should be taken into account when selecting nodes to create new lightning channels with? As Alex Brosworth recently pointed out that I see people connect to a well-connected node on Lightning Network. And by that, they mean they connect to a node with lots of channels. The number of channels is actually a contra-indicator of a node's ability to route. Good route routers curate and balance. Bad routes spam the open channel button. Emphasis added. When criteria should be kept in mind when evaluating notes while opening new channels on the Lightning Network. And we have here a phenomenal answer by Rene Picard. I agree with Alex Brosworth and have pointed this out about one year ago when I have fixed an issue about a strategy used by the LND autopilot, which basically looks for notes with a high channel count. 
this is one of the reason why I have created a standalone autopilot and provided an integration for, for the C Lightning with a plugin. There are several kinds of information we can look at, and my autopilot currently only looks at the first one, the network topology. That is, how can I increase my centrality, for example, by connecting to central nodes? How can I increase my probability to have a well-funded route by connecting to points where a lot of liquidity is floating around? Improve the network topology by increasing the amount of triangles. Geography. It is like that you pay to service where you live and therefore you might want to connect to nodes that have a similar geo IP as yours. Two, node provenance and properties. The age of the node seen by the old oldest channels. The age of the channels seen by the block height of funding transactions. The uptime of the node can be tracked via the gossip message and the gossip store. Routing fee of the node. Reliability of the node to forward payments can be tracked by doing fake one Satoshi payments to yourself over different routes. Most of the stuff that I mentioned here has been taken from my blog article about autopilots. In general, I hope that better autopilots will emerge because I think this problem will be hard to decide by humans without investing a lot of time. Finally, another strategy could be to create routing tables in a similar way as the border gateway protocol does on top of IP. In that case, nodes would share partial information about the channel balance so that we would have a better overview of where liquidity is missing. Again, fantastic answer. Thank you very much, Renee, and thanks for asking much. We have the next question here asked by an anonymous user. Is a Bitcoin address collision possible if generating 90 million addresses every four hours? I'm running a test to see if I can obtain a successful Bitcoin address collision after generating billions of addresses. I'm not entirely sure how I would check them yet. Basically, I have an extra 10 terabyte hard drive and I'm running super vanity gen on my 32 core 128 gigabyte RAM Linux work computer. It seems to generate around 19 million addresses, that is the address plus the private key pair, every four hours. Do you think it's possible or likely to run into an address collision this way? Or perhaps if everyone in the world did the same thing? Or what if I waited 10 to 20 years and then checked the addresses? This is all just a test to see if Bitcoin system is secure enough for big investment decisions. And we have here a quick answer by Peter Woolley. Thank you very much. Because of a birthday paradox, you only need 2 to the power of 80 addresses, despite the existing 2 to the power of 160 different address combinations, before a collision becomes probable. Thankfully, this is still an enormous number. At 90 million addresses per four hours, it will take around 445 times the age of the universe to reach that number. It's also irrelevant. Even if anyone or everyone generates 90 million addresses per four hours, there aren't that many addresses receiving funds. Thus, only actually used addresses matter. So the probability is puny. Thank you very much, Peter, for asking the, for answering this anonymous question. And we have a question here asked by Chris Stewart from Shirtbits and answered again by or, or edited by Merged. What is the trade-off between privacy and implementation complexity of Dandelion BIP156? Dandelion is a new relay protocol for transactions on cryptocurrency peer-to-peer -peer networks. It has been heralded as a huge privacy improvement for cryptocurrencies at the networking level. I'm wondering what cause this comes at. 1. Does Dandelion introduce more complexity into the code base? 2. Are these possible attack vectors introduced with Dandelion? And 3. What is the holdup with implementing Dandelion in Bitcoin Core? 
Great question. And we have an answer here by the Bitcoin Core contributor, S. Dev Tuar. In my view, the main implementation detail to be worked out with the dandelion ensuring that there are no denial of service vectors introduced. If the existing transaction really of Bitcoin Core transactions that do not make it into Node's mempool, a proxy of what we expect to be eventually mined do not get relayed to other nodes. In the Dandelion protocol, transactions are relayed in the stem phase prior to accepted acceptance into a node's mempool. As a result, there are potential denial of service vectors if transactions can be systematically relayed via Dandelion but ultimately not be accepted to anyone's to any node's mempool. This could either be introduced a bandwidth denial of service, where the Bitcoin network's bandwidth is used up or wasted, relaying ultimately useless data, or a CPU exhaustion denial of service, if expensive to validate transactions can be relayed without ultimately being mined. In general, the only way attackers pay for the network's resources they consume when relaying is via the transaction fee in their transaction. If attackers can generate transactions that do not ultimately get mined, then any side effect of the relay, such as the validation cost and bandwidth used, can be achieved for free since those transaction fees are never actually paid which typically implies that the network's resources could be utilized entirely, since it would be costless for an attacker to ramp up usage. It turns out that in a naive dandelion implementation, it would not be very difficult to generate transactions that would propagate in the stem phase, but would never, accept, never be accepted to the mempool at a very low cost. This is largely a consequence of the complexity around the mempool acceptance logic, and it seems particularly unavoidable given to the mempool's own anti-denial-of-service limits. The existing mempool acceptance logic attempts to prevent or limit the effect of these kind of denial-of-service attacks. Transactions don't have their signatures checked until just before the mempool acceptance after all of the transaction policy rules have been met to avoid CPU exhaustion attacks. Preventing bandwidth attacks is more involved. Transactions are only relayed after being accepted to our own mempool. If our own mempool fills up, it's a memory-limited data structure, then we can evit low fee rate transactions to make room for new transactions but new transactions are subject to higher minimum relay fee designed to offset or pay the relay fee for transactions which were evident or evicted from the mempool. It will thus no longer be mined until they relay again. In short, there's quite a bit of complexity in the mempool acceptance logic to prevent denial of service. In so in my view, the question around a dandelion implementations are, first, do we need something as complex as the current mempool logic in order to avoid denial of service vectors with dandelion? Or can we do something simpler? B, are there, ex are there acceptable modifications to the dandelion protocol that would simplify the denial of service analysis and allow for a simpler implementation while still providing a significant privacy boost to the network. As an example, would it be acceptable to implement Dandelion in such a way that you, under denial of service scenarios, we just fall back to the current relay model? C, if we don't have a simpler solution that works, is it worth implementing something akin to the current mempool logic, something called a stem pool, in some of the discussions, in order to introduce Dandelion into Bitcoin Core? Is the code complexity worth the privacy benefit that Dandelion would counter? While improving privacy on the network is obviously a good thing, the privacy benefits of Dandelion are limited. So is this is the kind of thing that's worth spending a lot of energy to implement and maintain, 
or should we focus on mental energy elsewhere? Fantastic detailed answer. Thank you very much. We have here another cool answer by the Bitcoin hodler. The expected use model for partially signed Bitcoin transaction. I want to use Bitcoin Core to create a partially signed Bitcoin transaction for offline signing, that is cold storage, of a multi-sig pay-to-witness script hash in a pay-to-script hash address, such as that created by the Glacier. Based on the partially signed Bitcoin transaction doc, I assume I want the, the online node to be the creator and updater and the offline node to be the signer and finalizer and extractor. First, what is the expected use model using RPCs? I've created private keys, redemption scripts, and matching addresses on an offline node. How do I import this into my online node? presumably as a watch-only address. Using the online node, how do I construct a partially signed Bitcoin transaction that spends some of the UTXOs for this address? Three, using the offline node, how do I sign said partially signed Bitcoin transaction using the private keys, redemption script, and the matching addresses that I have stored on paper? Secondly, is there a process expected to work on today's version 0.17.1 software? Is it expected to change in the near future? Thirdly, is this secure, assuming a secure offline node, but an insecure online node? Can I be sure this isn't funding a too large mining fee, for example? I understand that hardware wallets sometimes require the entire input transaction in order to verify the input amounts. Very good question. And we have a really good answer here by Andrew Chow. Thank you very much. And a long one. That's always good. <laughs> It is important to note that with this process, you will want to use a wallet that does not have private keys. Otherwise, you could accidentally, by sending Bitcoin to an address that is an online wallet. This is especially important with change address because change addresses are automatically pulled from the current wallet. By disabling private keys, you won't have any change address or other addresses in the wallet that has your address imported. You can also create a wallet that has no private keys by using the create wallet, type in your wallet name, true. When doing the following with the Bitcoin command line interface, make sure that you include the option RPC wallet of the wallet name so that you are using the correct wallet that does not have private keys. I've created private keys, redeem script, the matching address on an offline node. How do I import this onto my online node? Presumably a watch only address. Use the import multi command to import your address, the redeem script and their witness script, if any. When you receive coins to these addresses, you will be able to see them in your online wallet's balance using get balance zero true. Using an online node, how do I construct a partially signed Bitcoin transaction that spends some of the UTXOs for this address? You can use the wallet create funding PSBT command. Your command will be something like wallet create the fund PSBT of the recipient's address and the recipient's amount and the including watch only for the true change address. And what this will do is create a transaction with the outputs to your re recipients. It will then choose inputs from the wallet and add them to the transaction. If there is a change, it, it will use the change address that you specify in the wallet create fund a partially signed Bitcoin transaction has other options too. Read the help text for more information. Using the offline node, how do I sign said PSBT using the private keys, redemption script, and the matching address that I have stored on paper? Assuming that your offline node has the private keys, 
you can sign using the offline node by taking the PSBT from the previous step and using the wallet process PSBT command. Your command will be something like wallet PSPT, wallet process PSPT, and then the PSPT. It will give you the PSPT that contains signatures. You can double check this by decoding it with decode PSPT. Then you can finalize and extract using either your online or offline node. It doesn't matter. You will use finalize PSPT. If everything is correct, you will get a hex transaction that you can send with send raw transaction. If some part of the process failed, then it will fail to finalize and extract. So you will get another PSPT from finalize PSPT. Secondly, is this process expected to work with today's 0.70.1 software? Yes, it is. And is it expected to change in the near future? Not significantly. There may be more commands that are added that are useful, but not necessarily required. The format for the existing commands won't change significantly, if at all. Thirdly, is this secure? Assuming a secure offline node, but an insecure online node. Can I be sure that this isn't funding a too large mining fee, for example? I understand that hardware wallets sometimes require the entire input transaction in order to verify inputs and inputs amounts. Yes, it is secure, even if the online node is compromised. When the offline node signs, it does not it does several checks. It will check that the entire previous transaction included for non-witness inputs had a transaction ID that matches the one specified in the transaction being made. This ensures that you are spending what you are expected to be spending. For SegWit inputs, part of what you are signing is the value of the outputs being signed. So you always know what amount you are spending. If the amount is incorrect, if it does not match the amount that you are expected for that output, the signature will be invalid and thus the whole transaction will be invalid. These checks ensure that what you sign will either be exactly what you, be, what you expect it to be or that the result is invalid and nothing moves anyways. Since the transaction includes full amount and script pub key information, you can double check that the amounts are correct, the fee is correct, the inputs are the ones you want to use, and that the outputs are the ones you want to create by using the decode partially signed Bitcoin transaction command. Thank you, Andrew, for this fantastic answer. Next question by HeroFire and edited by Merged. Sending a transaction to mining nodes only Instead of propagating transactions across all nodes in the Bitcoin network, would it be theoretically better to just send transactions to mining nodes as the transactions are only confirmed and quote unquote used when confirmed inside a block? The other nodes would then be able to confirm a valid and validate these transactions when they learn and the new, newly mined blocks within the confirmed transactions. And we have a good answer here by Peter Woolley. Thank you very much. In theory, that would be ideal if your goal is solely getting tr transactions to mine. However, it hurts permissionless mining. However, it does require knowing how to reach miners directly. Mining is designed to be a permissionless business, acceptable, accessible, for anyone with the right hardware. Your solution would require publishing the IP address of miners to, a tra to all transaction creators. It hurts sender's privacy. It would also hurt the privacy as miners would learn that the sender's IP of transaction creators, possibly enabling them to censor based on that information. You would not really transaction doesn't gain you much. The marginal cost of relaying every transaction to every node is low since the introduction of the algorithms like BIP-152 compact blocks assume a transaction will eventually be mined anyway. The transaction needs to reach every full node eventually as part of a block. Relaying it is also a separate transaction ahead of time. It doesn't cost anything. 
if the relay of the block can, uh, can refer to the earlier transaction instead. There are some costs relaying the invalid messages that can be reduced though without removing the transaction relay. It hurts block propagation speed. And lastly, only broadcasting transactions to miners directly would worsen block propagation speed very significantly. Modern block, block relay protocols like BIP-152 or Fiber rely on nodes knowing the bulk of blocks transactions ahead of time to quickly relay those blocks. Fantastic answer. Thank you very much, Peter. And we have here another question by MRWNRNT10. How does proof of work inspire trust when the work is just guessing? I'm struggling to understand the value added by machines guessing at inputs to create a hash below a target value in order to produce a proof of work. I understand the proof of work is somehow supposed to inspire trust in the dis a distributed record of transactions. How? Why should someone winning a lottery cause me to have trust in a blockchain? Great question. And we have here a good answer by uh, Citric. Forget proof of work for a second. Let's instead imagine that you have a box and you've placed a lock on it in order to secure its, correct, uh, its contents. Now, if someone asks you how secure the contents are, then the size and type of lock is fairly important. Type, tying a box close with a bit of string isn't very good security, at least compared to a heavy duty padlock. For an attacker to get into the box and alter its contents, they will need to work much harder to get past the padlock compared to the string. You can use the word work here in the thermodynamic sense, energy being used to perform an action. In order to break into the box, there is a minimum amount of work we would expect the assailant to have done. The minimum amount of work to break the padlock is obviously higher than the string. So we consider the padlock more secure. Keep that point in mind. Breaking into a more secure box requires more work. You cannot fake the work. You either have the resources to cut the lock or not. So let's go back to Bitcoin mining. When a miner is hashing to find a valid proof of work, they are doing work by expanding energy as computational cycles. The POW functions is, is devised such that we can expect a certain amount of work to be done on average in order for the miner to find a valid block. You can think of this proof of work as a lock that has been put on the block. In order for an attacker to alter the history of transactions, they will have to perform on average the same amount of work, spending energy, a real resource, in order to find a new valid proof of work to replace the block, breaking the lock, as in our example of above. And thus, the history of transactions is secured by miners spending energy to create a proof of work that required for a block to be valid. More energy spent mining creates a more secure lock, since a malicious miner would be expected to spend an equal amount of energy in order to break it. Miners are incentivized to continue building upon old blocks and thus piling one lock on top of another lock, on top of another lock. And it, it, it is this mechanism which allows the history of Bitcoin transactions to be considered secure. Fantastic answer here. Thank you, Citric. And these were quite many uh, Bitcoin Stack Exchange questions. Uh, thank you very much to all the contributors. And let's continue with notable code changes. This week in Bitcoin Core, LND, C Lightning, Eclair, and Lipsec P 256K1. This Bitcoin Core change switches the random number generator from the open SSL to Bitcoin's core own implementation. Although the RNG output gathered by Bitcoin Core is fed out to the OpenSSL and then read back in when the program needs strong randomness, this moves Bitcoin Core a little closer to no longer needing the dependence on OpenSSL, as that dependency has caused security issues in the past. 
this pull request, the script description, and the code changes are very well documented for anyone concerned about the safety of this change. This Bitcoin core change adds a new REST call, block hash by height, for fetching the block in the current best blockchain based on its height, how many blocks after the Genesis block it is. This Bitcoin core change sets the whitelist force relay configuration option to off by default. When enabled, this option causes a node to relay transactions from its manually whitelisted peers and clients, even if those transactions violate node policy or consensus rules. This could also cause the relaying nodes, rather than the origin node or client, to be banned by its peers. So it's better by default to turning this option off. Developers are also asking anyone using this feature to contact them so that they know it's not an unused option that should be depreciated in the future. A LND change adds a chain notifier subverter, allowing services to receive notifi notifications about changes to the best blockchain, such when a new blocks are received when transactions get confirmed, and whether or not an input has been spent. This LND change allows different autopilot heuristics to be combined into a single score for each node to which you could connect. The higher a score, the more it's expected that opening a channel to that node will increase the connectivity of your node, according to various characteristics. This LND change adds a query option for the autopilot that accepts a list of all Lightning Network nodes and returns the scores for those nodes, indicating how good a candidate they are for opening a channel to them. This LND change adds support for the max hash time logs contract field in the channel updates. This feature allows light clients and pruned nodes to learn the maximum routing capacity of a channel belonging to the distant node without having to look up the channel's opening transaction on the blockchain, something which archival nodes can do. But with light clients and pruned nodes can't, not easily at least. Now, LND nodes advertise this information directly, which not only helps light clients and pruned nodes, but it also allows Lightning Network nodes to specify a value below their maximum if they only want to route smaller payments in the future. It could also help support multi path payments, payments that are split into parts so that the total payment can be larger than the capacity of the smallest channels used. And this LND change adds a new subused subsystem that updates the channel backup file each time a new channel is opened or closed. Users whose backup this file can run a recovery command that will attempt to close each channel in its most recent settled state after reconnecting to that channel's remote peer and initiating the data loss protection protocol specified in bold 2. Footnote. The final paragraph of Bolt 2 describes the output data loss protection option. The basic idea is that the node has the potential, potentially lost sum of its state can encourage its peers to initiate a channel close. Since the peers still has the most recent state, it could close the channel using the state and allow both nodes to receive the most recent balance. This method does carry a risk the peer can guess that something is wrong and attempt to steal funds from the state, a stale note by closing the channel using an old state. But the risk is mitigated in large part by the Lightning Network penalty mechanism. If the stale note does have a revocation of the old state in its backups, it can create a breach remedy transaction, a justice transaction, that will seize all of the lying peer's funds from the channel. Because of this risk, peers using the option data loss protect mechanism have an incentive to close the channels honestly with the latest state when they hear that from a stale node. The backups are encrypted using a key from your own LND keychain, which itself should be encrypted with a strong passphrase of your choice. 
we have a C lightning change that re-enables the bold two option data loss protection field, which again points to the same footnote. After I after it was disabled by default in December, see the code changes in the section of newsletter 26. This eclair change sends a payment using the channel with the lowest available balance that can support sending the payment. This reserves the values in the higher value channels for larger payments that may come later. Ultimately, if the network adopts multipath payments, the need to keep at least one channel with a balance larger than the largest payment you want to send should go away. Peers, this was a long one, but you got to subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter to receive all this in-dense information into your inbox every single Tuesday. Thank you very much to all the sponsors and contributors of this phenomenal, phenomenal uh, institution and see you on the next reading. Thank you very much and bye-bye.